Uh, we're always glad everybody's here, and uh, we're still trying to make our way through the book of Hebrews, but not verse by verse. And I have uh, yet to fail to remind you that the book of Hebrews is written to people who uh, are just grown tired and weary, and they kind of want to give up. And they're kind of leaving this life with Christ and going back to where they used to be. Or they're getting themselves entangled in sin and getting pulled back to where they used to be. And the writer has made argument after argument as to why they should stay the course. But as you begin verse 14 of chapter 12, <clears throat> it, it, it begins something that's a little difficult. And it sounds like it's changing subjects. But before I look, have you look at anything... I want to ask you, what is your disposition when you're tired and you're weary and you're troubled and you're a little bit aggravated? What is your disposition? Now, I'm always cheery. It makes no difference. <laughs> but, but, but what is your disposition when you're like that? Cranky. I, I, that's really a good word. Is it cranky? What? what? What is there another word? Sad. Kind of sad. Depressed. Depressed. I really like the word cranky. What, what does that mean? Hard to get along with. Kind of hard to get along with. Um, my voice is kind of sharp. <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 get, I get worse quickly. In other words, you push me very far, I get worse quickly. Uh, I think may, some of that must be going on in this particular situation where people are just getting tired and weary and worn out and they're on edge and they're cranky. And all of a sudden he says, I want you to make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holiness. For without, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, that first part of that statement is made frequently in the Bible. I want you to make every effort to live in peace with all men. And when we're tired and we're weary and we're cranky and we're on edge, how does that work? And in churches... And in church groups, and in associated church groups, how does that work? It affects everyone that knows it. It affects everyone. It causes great, great big battles. And I know that I have to be really, really careful of what I say on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday nights because it's being watched. And uh, Burke puts out sometimes little shorts, as I've told you. One of our lessons recently, we had over 700 views on YouTube on, on a short, a little 90-second statement. A couple came to me Sunday and said, uh, did you really get spankings when you were a child with a belt? And, and I said, yes. Well, they listened last Wednesday night. Uh, but I'm going to take a risk, and I'm going to tell you when Greg read about a lectureship in Lubbock, Texas, it brought back memories that were not warm memories. Okay? It brought back actually a bit of maybe higher blood pressure and maybe me wanting to go in battle mode. Because the cousin to this lectureship, when I was very young, I stumbled in with another person and decided to go to Denton to a lectureship just, just to try to learn. And I may have told you this story, but I sat on the back row, which is my favorite place. I learned that in the Baptist church. <laughs> and I, uh, I'm sitting there and I haven't been there. I was there maybe five minutes. And a preacher gets up behind the pulpit and the preacher uh, says, and he was a pretty famous name preacher. I've been preaching for 60 years, and my friend over here called his name, pretty famous preacher, been preaching for 45 years. My friend over here called, been preaching. We, but together we have 130 years experience, something like that. 
And then they started beating to death this local preacher in this town, this city. They started saying all kinds of ugly things. And I'm thinking, what, what's going on? And then on the other side of the auditorium, about as far back as I was, a young man got up, only he was pretty tall and pretty big and kind of built like Greg, only maybe a little bit taller. And he walks up and he takes over the pulpit. And he said, you gentlemen are talking about my dad. And I didn't know what was going to happen next. But I sat there and thought, if that had been me and I were that young, and they had been talking about my dad, it would have been a whole lot worse because straw knows how immature I have been. It would have been a whole lot worse. And so you fast forward 20 years or so, and I'm the president of a university, and I'm at the back of an auditorium one night, and something hasn't gone quite correctly in the auditorium where all the city of Lubbock has been invited in the year 2000 it was, in the year 2000, when we had Y2K. Anybody remember what Y2K meant? Remember how the world was going to fall apart? And so they had these special things about Y2K in the, the, the Lubbock Avalanche Journal, which was a newspaper, the corrupt newspaper business. Zonel, I mean, I'm just, you know. That's a joke, everybody. I, my my sister-in-law's here, and she's the president of the Oklahoma Press Association, so I'm, it's a joke. Uh, but something was said, and the king of this uh, lectureship was at the back of the auditorium with some other people and launched the attack. And uh, before it was over, Suze was crying. Another preacher was ready to go to blows. And I finally said, just stop everything. And I said, could I tell you something about what you're advocating. I said, I went to one of your lectureships and I told him the story I just told you. And I said, what about that picture has to do with love? And what about that picture has to do with peace? And I figured I'd get written up in the papers because that was, that's your favorite thing to do. But I never heard from him again. People are vicious. You know that? I got another one. I got another one. Several years ago from Lubbock Christian, I spoke over at Oklahoma Christian on a little lectureship. I just taught this leadership stuff. And, I'm, and I'm, somebody sends me a bulletin from Lawton, Oklahoma. And I read the article in the bulletin and it says, these people have spoken in the lectureships and they're heretics and they're this. And my name's there. And I'm thinking, wow, my name's there? So I pick up the phone. I call a church in Lawton, Oklahoma. I said, hey, I, I may well deserve this. You put my name in this article. Yeah, I may well reserve, deserve it, but I'd at least like to know why, what I've done. The fellow literally said, I have no idea. I just copied that, that out of another article, out of another bulletin, out of Wellington, Texas. I said, wow. So I called Wellington, Texas. I get a hold of the preacher there. I said, hey. You put my name in an article, I understand, and I said, uh, I may deserve I may deserve this, but could you just tell me why? I, I'd just really like to know why. He said, I don't know why. He said, I got a letter in my file about you somewhere. And I said, you got a letter in your files about me? What in the world does that letter say? Could you send me a copy of that letter? Well, I, I never got a copy of that letter. How, how do we treat each other? How, 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 do we, how do we treat each other? Uh, and all of a sudden, for cranky people, he says, live in peace with everyone. Isn't that interesting? Even when you're cranky. That's my, that's my terminology. I didn't say it right here. You just live in peace with everyone. You know, I might be getting a little bit better about that, by the way, at this age, but I've sure, sure struggled with that in days gone by, okay? And to be holy, 
Now, just, now be careful of that word. What, is, what does the word holy mean? Set aside. Set aside. That's it. Set apart. To be, to be set apart. You don't be like everybody else. You, you, you're special. You've been set apart. God literally made us holy. The only way anything ever gets holy in this world is that God makes it holy. Everybody got that? God is holy. The only way anything else can ever become holy is that God makes it holy. You've got to remember that. That's why at the burning bush, God will say to Moses, take off what? Your shoes, because this is, what did we sing? This is holy ground. How did that ground get holy? God made it to be holy. In the New Testament, it says, you and I have been set apart in Christ, and we are now called what? Holy people. We're set apart. We're different. You've got to remember, you're set apart. You, you make every effort to live in peace and be, and be different from how all these other people act. Does that make sense? And see to it that no one misses the grace of God and no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one misses the grace of God? I don't, I don't understand that verse. I truly don't understand it. What does that mean? Well, the grace of God was extended through Jesus Christ. It was a free gift. You don't want to miss Jesus Christ. And see too that no one misses the grace. And in context here, it kind of feels like, see, like no one misses the way God acts toward you. You, you act like that toward other people. Don't miss the grace of God in your life. We're to be grace-filled people. Even when we feel like being cranky, we're supposed to be grace-filled people. And so if you're set apart and you're trying to live in peace, he goes ahead to say, which is really, really out of context, it feels like in the book of Hebrews, but it's here for a reason. Don't be sexually immoral. Don't act like Esau and be godless who for a single meal sold his inheritance, his rights as an older brother. Afterward, as you know, he wanted to inherit his blessing, but he was rejected. Well, what's all that about? Everybody remember the Esau deal? The hunter who's tricked. Father's tricked. And, and, and he thinks he's starving to death. I've been there. I think I'm starving to death. I'm really not, but I think I'm starving to death. I, I, I'll give you this porridge. I'll give you this soup here. If you'll give me your birthright deal, let's do it. And later he says, well, I'm the oldest. I, I came, we're twins, but I'm the oldest. And I, I deserve that, but he already messed it up. He seems to be saying by being ugly and cranky, and he seems to be saying by forgetting your set-apart status in life and by getting involved in the world with things like sexually immoral, that you're doing the same thing Esau is doing. You're taking what God has given you, your rights, and, where you're, and you're tossing it aside. You're treating it like it's nothing. Uh, and he's giving us a big warning. And, I, and again, I, I know I need to be careful because people are listening and maybe I shouldn't have said what I said about all this, but what I said was absolutely true. Absolutely true. Let me, can I tell you something? Do you think you have to defend God? Do you think you have to defend God? No. She's the right one. Devil gets, devil wants you to try. We, we're not here to defend God. We're here to proclaim God. And if God needs defending, God defend himself. Nothing can stand against God. And if God's getting reworked somehow, God will ultimately take care of that. Uh, and, and so if I, if I, I, sometimes I get this idea that Greg is wrong. And so I got to, man, for God's sake, I got to get Greg right. No, that, that's, not what, that's not what this is teaching. Now, 
I know Aquila and Priscilla took someone aside and they taught him more perfectly out of gentleness and kindness and, and I think we can talk about things, but I'm not here to, to, to defend God. I, I'm here to proclaim God. And am I, am I here to defend the truth? Well, it says that, but I'm here to defend the truth in a way that I try to speak the truth in love as I've been told to speak. I just treat the, speak it in love. And if people would learn to t say what they think in love and in kindness, you can say whatever you want if you want to say it in love and kindness. And I can kind of listen to it. And I can kind of contemplate what you're saying. And maybe I can kind of learn your point of view. But if you start from the point of view that uh, i got to straighten you out because you're way off and you're, it's never going to work. So here's the rule. Here's the rule I have taught to corporations, all who will listen, taught to every group. It's truth plus grace over time equals growth or health. Now, where do you think I got that principle? In John chapter 1 and verse 14, Jesus came full of what? Grace and truth. Grace and truth. So if you and I can go through life with truth combined with grace, and we do that over time in our families, it makes for what kind of a family? A healthy family. So if, if someone needs to correct me, and they come to me, and they do it in kindness, like one of my good friends who's dead now, I told you the story, came to me one time, and we're, we're, people thought we were brothers, thought we looked alike. And, 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 he, and he pulls up my driveway and he kills his pickup. And I'm thinking, I'm in for a long siege here because he can talk for a long time. And he said, Ken, people think you and I are brothers. And you, you know I have two brothers. And in some ways, you're closer to me than either one of my brothers. But I got to tell you something. You're not smiling anymore. Something's wrong with you. I think your job's killing you. Now, was I going to fight? Was I going to get mad and slam the door and say, Larry, get out of my driveway? Instead, I hung my head and said, I am man, Larry. You're the third one that's told me this in three weeks. You're right. Because he told me the truth in what? In love. Everybody getting that? That's, that's, how you, that's how you proclaim God. That's how you make a difference in people's lives. You're not my enemy. You may look different from me, differently from me, and you may act different from, from me, differently from me. You may talk differently from me. You may believe differently from me gives me no right to slam my fist on the desk and yell at you and say, when are you going to get straightened up? What I do have the right to do is say, you're one of my best friends of life, or you're, 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 you mean so much to me, or I admire you so much, or you're such a, you're such a special person. Would you, would you want to hear what I, how I view this? And you're going to look at me and say, well, yeah, I'll listen to you. And I may get all three and you say, well, it's a good theory, but I don't know that I see it that way. And I smile, I say, I understand. I understand. Does that make sense to anybody? I'm just not into this. Uh... I've, got a, I've got a good I talked to this friend last week. He lives in Houston right now. He was a K through 12 principal, so a superintendent, headmaster of a, of a private school. He said, let me tell you my best story. He said, my best story was a man walked in my office one day and he's really upset because his son had gotten in trouble. And he pulls out a knife about that long and he just re reaches over and stabs it right in the middle of my desk and looks at me. And I look at him and I said, uh, 
hey, I'm going to get a coffee, cup of coffee. You want one? He said, I got it and left and got a cup of coffee. The guy standing there looking like I was crazy. I came back and sat down and said, you're going to pay for the desk. He said, that father looked at me and said, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll pay for the desk. Looked at my knife back. <laughs> but he handled, it, he handled it so beautifully with such grace. You know, you want a cup of coffee? And he gets up and leaves and brings back a cup of coffee. You're going to pay for my desk. Masterful, masterful. Uh, anyway, thank you for listening to me ramble for a little while. And forgive me if I overstated my case on one deal, but as soon as Greg made the announcement, Sue's looked over at me, her eyes locked, and we both knew exactly what was, this was all about.